So in these labs today, and this one's on purposeful action, uh, we had that winter retreat back in January. Was it January, February, early February, late January, on purposeful action, one of the Wisconsin experience tenets, themes, purposeful action, relentless curiosity, intellectual confidence, and empathy and humility. So we finished up that four, those four themes of the different retreats, winter and fall retreats, um, for the last four, two years now, Teaching Academy. So this is in some ways a revisit and a let's dig in a little bit further to purposeful action. What does it mean to have activities and assignments and uh, content curriculum that is purposeful and meaningful for students that leads them into doing something that is more than just writing a paper or turning in an, an assignment. Who are you and what topics or subtopics, questions would you like us to address this hour um, so that you leave and you think this was useful rather than uh, they didn't talk about what I wanted to talk about. This is the chance to um, have us talk about what you want to talk about. <coughs> My name is John Martin, and I work at New at Academic Technology. I'm the facilitator for this program, and I've been involved in, um, it's kind of a passion for me, social learning, getting out and doing, um, having students learn from each other, share with each other, that sort of thing. So purposeful action for me could be anything from go work with the community, and I, I don't say go help the community because I think you gotta work with the community before they, um, so you know what they want. If you just say, oh, I'm gonna come in and save you, that sort of savior, academic, intellectual savior complex is very <coughs> off-putting and we often end up causing more damage than, than help. So, starting small, I like to start small and say, all right, this felt good working with one person, now how can I take it up to the next step? But often for me it starts with working with people. So that's one thing that I like to think about. How do we do that in our classes? Who would like to go next and tell us what you would like to talk about? Cliff. I'll always go first. I find that I don't have much to contribute yet. I'm here on a very reception basis. So my name is Cliff Cunningham. I work with Dude Academic Technology. And uh, I'm a tech guy. I'm not a trainer. So I like to come and sit around. I'm sorry, not an educator in that formal sense. And I just like to listen to what you guys have to say. Uh, very, I mean, for me, purposeful action has always been, here is a thing I need to teach you. You come and sit down, and I will teach you this thing. <laughs> so like anything beyond that is, is, is butter. Uh, I'm Danny, so I'm a PhD student here at uh, UW uh, in the epidemiology program. Uh, I'm curious, maybe today, like one thing I'd be curious to learning about is if you set up an activity that's kind of based off of sharing experiences and kind of you know uh, participants I guess coming into it. How do you set up bounds if you want to try to guide that towards some sort of skill or, or conclusion at the end of it? Good um, constraints and guidance. I'm going to leave it broad like that. Um, we can get into it a little bit more. Good, thank you. Molly? Uh, my name is Molly Harris. I am a graduate student in classical and ancient Near Eastern studies. Um, Super purposeful action area, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, one of my questions would be, um, yeah, to make topics that might not seem immediately relevant, relevant to students, and also, <laughs> Um, how to incorporate these sorts of things um, into courses that have that already have sort of a curriculum and a structure and that you're not able to change that much. So that's an experience you have a lot as a graduate student, but I imagine faculty do as well. You have a certain um, course that need to get, you know, it's already designed to get the students from one place to another and how do you incorporate purposeful action without needing to change the course too much. Yeah. I'll put that as minimal, uh, maybe not the right word, but <laughs> I'll put it in quotes, minimal interventions. Yeah. Because you're right, the learning outcomes for the course, the course outcomes are set by the program outcomes and 
we cannot change those. <coughs> um, we can change our section outcomes, but they have to align the course outcomes to the program outcomes. We don't have control over that. It's been set by the curriculum committee. Adam. Um, I'm Adam Mendick. I have my PhD from the old urban planning program here on campus, and I will be a first time lecturer this summer uh, in a course on government and natural resources. And um, I want to expose expose the students to, uh, and we will use as case studies, um, sort of real projects that, that have been done that are either not really in progress because there's issues with that, but have been recently completed, like environmental impact statements and analyses. Um, and I guess my questions are, are really kind of nuts and bolts, um, and, and I'm going to have a hard time articulating it, but it deals with sort of choice of you know, giving them a range of you know which projects they would want to work on, and how does that interact with um, individual versus group uh, projects? Because I was thinking group, but if you're giving choice, I mean, how do you how do you work that out? Okay, I'm an, I'm, yeah. an, I'm trying to figure out how to rephrase this in three words or five yeah. words. Um, any suggestions? So I, I I'm choice hearing the case versus, studies. Choice, choice versus group. I choice think. versus group. Individual. individual versus group choice. Yeah. All right, good. Margaret. Hi, Margaret Murphy. I'm a grad student uh, at the high school, and uh, I'm here to assist with uh, John and the active teaching plan. Excellent. And Jennifer? Um, I'm Jennifer Warbaker, and I'm also assisting with the active teaching lab. And we have Haley Kirkhoff. Hi Haley, everybody wave to Haley. <laughs> uh, she's from continuing studies at the Learning Design Development and Innovation, and then Lauren Jewett is also trying to tune in, but she's having trouble. Oh no, August. Lauren, we're gonna we'll, we'll get it figured out for you eventually, Lauren. <laughs> Not that you could hear that, but Right. <laughs> Peter. Uh, good morning, I'm Peter Van Gan. I'm a neuroscience neuroscientist in the kinesiology department and I you know for me purposeful action kind of I've been exploring around and redesigning courses to apply and make a bridge between course content you know which is essentially you know studying the brain studying the mind neuroscience uh, and applicability you know when people beyond the time they graduate and second of all, I think, um, you know, I think it's very important to um, find or to tap into students' intrinsic motivation because once they see the usefulness of what you're trying to do, they buy into it and there's a lot more flexibility in terms of, you know, the activities and the approach that you can take. <coughs> all right. If hooking intrinsic motivation. <laughs> is that is that that's not good enough? Yeah, I mean it's kind of like connecting that intrinsic motivation with you know uh, longer term goals in terms of you know application that would be useful after the graduate. You know, so I'm you know thinking about um, you know getting away from you know you telling them something you tell them they tell you back what you told them. But um, much more in terms of providing a big a bigger picture, a bigger framework that um, you know they might remember four or five years from now rather than, you know, the end of the semester. Something like that. How about structuring motivation? Right. Because that way it you provide the structure and they take off with whatever they need to, but they're not totally lost, which is often the case, right? We, I want to do something, I don't know how to do it. I want to apply towards the class, but I don't know how to make it apply towards the class or course content. So if I can get, give me a structure so that I can do it, drives my passions in a way that I can also learn in this topic area. Right, right. I, you know, I think that's, that's important. And I, you know, it, it leads to enjoyment of the students yeah. as well as the instructor. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So it, the, the two go together and it kind of, like it's a snowball effect. 
in a way, if it goes right. <laughs> Our highest point as instructors is when we see their eyes go like, oh, yeah, yeah. and they right. get it, right? So if we can let, yeah. OK. We all know what that's going to be when we visit it. Good. Patty. Um, I'm Patty Coffey. I teach in the psychology um, department. I'm actually a clinical psychologist came to teaching kind of later. And so I've been pretty interested in getting students out into um, the community doing settings. So I have a number of independent um, study students who do service learning types of uh, placements. And I meet with them around academic articles related to their placements. And I, have a, I teach a criminal psych class. It's pretty large, we have 106 people in that class, and I do work with the Madison Urban Ministry. They come in and do a prisoner reentry simulation every year, which has been just incredibly powerful for students. And I'm just looking for ways to do more of that. Um, I do... Your plate's not full enough with... Uh, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> well, and actually, I just, you know, it's hard to, I think it's so powerful <laughs> to do in terms of uh, learning how to do that. And so I, you know, like, I don't, but I don't know how to get 100 and six students into something other than like my prisoner reentry simulation. Are there other things I could get that many people out doing? Or I've got, you know, 385 now in my large intro psych class. Is there, are, is there a way to do something like that with, with a class that big that gets them out engaged? Because my experience has been with a lot of my psych major students or service learning um, independent study is they come in they have a lot of volunteer experience typically from high school and, and you know and applying for college and they've kind of they've been structured in place and then many of them have just been so busy particularly if they're having to work at all that they're not able to get out and and do things and it's just it's sort of you know um, pushing that um, <coughs> engagement that service um, perspective back in their lives and also integrating it in with everything they've been doing coursework wise so I, I would just like to expand that or figure out ways to get that going with larger groups. All right, I'm putting down managing or, um, <coughs> options and logistics. <laughs> Lauren. Uh, I'm Lauren Rosen and I direct a language program for UW System. Um, and so I guess I have kind of two things coming at this. One, um, languages are typically not required. And so, yet at the same time, if you think about being able to communicate with somebody other than those who speak your native language, it already has a purpose, right? So in a sense, this is an intrinsic thing to our program, yet it's not a required thing, so we don't have a good cohort. And so I guess where my question would be is, um, I can very much see um, the importance <coughs> of this and wondering how we can intentionally, not only intentionally foster it in our classes, but get a broader understanding across disciplines of how all of the different possibilities of courses they could take integrate into this together. Does that make any sense at all? What, what I'm hearing is, um, or, or at least where my brain went, was this also ties with empathy and humility, being able to understand other people. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there's a, a level of intellectual confidence and in being willing to go in there. Right. So, I mean, and relentless curiosity. Tell me more about you and your culture and who you are. Um, so, it, in many ways, the, all four of those things tie in deeply and, and, and really yet it's not all required that anybody ever right. <laughs> like do this. Well, so <laughs> what do we do about that? <laughs> so the Wisconsin experience in general is not a requirement. It's a we hope that our students leave with this, but it's not formalized right. into any so sort of how do we <coughs> intentionally make that happen? All right. Formalizing in many ways this is um we had a session not so long ago called uh, Soft Skills, mm -hmm. Teaching Soft Skills. I mean, in right every there. discipline, we want our students to be able to get along, to have those four things, but we never teach them purposefully or grade them on that. It's sort of a side expectation. You learn the content, and whether you're a good person or not is, is right. sort of off on the side. So, yeah, so how do you make it intentional and then assess 
the intentionality of it like you assess anything else you intentionally want them to know. All right. Formalizing. I'm just going to say formalizing with intention. Maybe that's repetitive. Good. Kenny. Uh, my name is Kenny Kemp. I'm a grad student in the Kinesis department. And I guess a couple of my concerns have already been shared. The minimal intervention, not wanting to reinvent the wheel yeah. for the course, and then the logistics and stuff, especially with class size and limited support. Um, I guess I'm also just looking for good practices of implementing this into a course. I am going to do uh, plug and play. Are there like any things that have already been developed or other resources that we can say, oh, here's a list of 20 things you can try with that are easy to do, hard to do, medium to do. So we'll do a plug and play. And Justine? Hi, uh, hi I'm Justine Chen, and I am a new teaching and learning service coordinator at Whistle, which is the Wisconsin Collaboratory for Enhanced Learning. So we focus on active um, learning. So we have two active learning classrooms in college, library, and also went library. So my goal or like my the the idea to get to here to learn about the purposeful learning is like I really believe like learning by doing. So active learning is really important. And I like your idea talking about community and that is also a good connection. But sometimes, like Patty said, the students are so busy with their daily life. So with active learning, can we bring some of this idea into the classroom and make the classroom, when they are on campus, their learning is purposeful learning and also meaningful learning and connect to their daily life and also the real world. So yeah, that's my idea. Uh, holistic connections. Yes. <laughs> Feel free to. Yes. All right, and Dustin. Oh, yes, okay, I'm uh, Dustin. I'm emeritus at African Cultural Studies and also interested in uh, what uh, Laurel brought forward and Justine talked about in the holistic connection. Okay, so who would like to explain what purposeful action is? <laughs> I have the website. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Badgers strive to find greater meaning every day. Well, paraphrase it for us, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it uh, is applying knowledge and skills to solve problems and engage in the community and all the things that you were talking about before. So the, the community. And, and who is the community? When it talks about the community, who who is it talking about? Or It can be as big or small <laughs> as you want it to be. It can be the world community, or it can be your local neighborhood. I think it can be all of that. And what's easiest for students to start with? Between those two. Extremes. Yeah. Very, yes, it's a very They're broad a range there. <laughs> the world. <laughs> their dorm, their apartment building. <laughs> they lived lives, right? It's the, it's the, I'm new here. What are the things that I come to college with? friends, family, you know, those are the big connections in my life so far. My neighborhood back home, or if it's an online my neighborhood around me right now, or if it's face to face right now, the people in the residence <coughs> hall down in the next door, across the hall, um, the person I'm sitting next to in class, like these are all parts of their community. Narrowly focused, right? And maybe that's is that the place to start, or is that too small? Do we want to like push them to be a little bit outside of their comfort zone? So we say, no, don't just start there. Go with a group off campus and take a look at this or that or, or the other thing. How would you work with people in prisons? Is that too <laughs> far to go from step one? For some students, it would be. For others, no. No, some come in really wanting to do that. So, but and I, that's where I think the choice is really important. What, what what would you like to do? But I love to see students get out into community agencies because they're often quite surprised by actually Madison. You know, they have this idea of the campus, and yeah. if they're they're not from Madison, they get into the schools and they say, oh, 
there's all kinds of things here beyond what we see right here. And I think, because it can feel like you're in Madison when you're on campus, but you're, you're not. No, <laughs> it's a lot of red and yeah. white and, you know, <laughs> there's a... A lot more diversity and they're, they're, just, they're just exposed to a lot of things that are not on campus. So I, I think that's pretty eye-opening for students that we have this kind of very, you know, progressive kind of community and it, it looks pretty homogenous when you're on campus and then you start venturing out and you start realizing that things are much more complex even in a place like um, Madison. So. Yeah. And the, the, the choice is partly due to the comfort level that they're at, right? We want to respect that, but we also want to push them a little bit beyond that. Because I suspect that you've seen this and you probably have all experienced this yourself. Once you do something successfully that you're afraid of, but you're kind of pushed into it and then you survive and you're like, oh, okay, I can get used to this. This is good. <laughs> then you start saying, well, what's the next step? And yeah, this is uncomfortable. Okay, no, I, 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 did, I can do it. And eventually you become really brave about like, oh, I'll just do this other thing. Let's go over here. What's going on over here? And then you, you know, get beaten back a little bit maybe because you took on too much. So where is that sweet spot? And having them, rewarding them for going outside I think is a really big, outside of their comfort zone is a really big part of this. So some sort of not just intrinsic motivation, but extrinsic motivation, how can we also like give them a little carrot for, for, for following their nose mm -hmm. um, or reward them for doing that? What, um, what does that look like? Or uh, the very simple level, what would that look like? Because we talked about what are some minimal interventions where we want to talk about. So what would some minimal interventions look like? Minimal things that they can do in their class that or that anyone can do in a class, even if you don't have a lot of control over it. What kinds of control does one have in a class where one doesn't have a lot of control? One thing that I've done um, in classes, yeah, when you don't have a lot of time, you can't really assign too much extra work or you don't have that much time in class to spend on it, mm -hmm. um, is sharing um, is having something really short that students can read um, and usually something from like a newspaper or a magazine or like some or a uh, clip of a movie or something like that um, that is even just tangentially related to what we study but to see like oh this is out there in the world and this is what other people are reading and their impression of I mean Romans agree I just believe like Romans Greek and Roman literature, um, and they're referenced all the time in popular culture. Um, but so having something that doesn't take the students a lot of time to read or watch, um, and I just ask the students to write two sentences, and it could be anything, they could be questions, they could be thoughts, like it's not, it's graded for like completion, and then we compile them and look at them all together. And I don't know, that sort of, I found that students mostly write questions, which I wasn't expecting. Hmm. Um, and so then those questions can lead us to, I don't know, Discussions. some further action. But well, and tying, I, I love yeah. the idea of, of using the examples, yeah. stories and cases, in order to tie their lives, getting to the intrinsic motivation, <coughs> to this other life that happened back in, yeah. the Roman glory days, or, or whatever your topic is. And Adam, you talked about cases that had already been done, mm -hmm. but have been done recently or just completed, because yeah. you can't have them messing around in things that are currently underway, that especially at, at the level that they're operating at, they don't have the expertise yet. Right. But stepping them through those stories and hearing the decisions that were made, and you know, what decision would you have made if you were faced with this? Right. That is a way to connect their own interests, their own, giving them sort of a, a simulated choices. I, you know, I, I might have done it this way, or I'm, and have them talk through that so that when they do take that step into the next, outside of the comfort zone in a real situation, they have at least that simulation or those stories <laughs> and examples to, to draw on. Well, and in the class that I'm going to be teaching, 
the assumption, at least, is that these are people who are going into public service, so it's kind of giving them early exposure to that. Yeah. So it's almost cheating a little bit compared to maybe some of what some of the other things, but it's um, it's, it's sort of more professional focused. And it's authentic and it's real because it, and it just happened and that's the difference I think between these two the classics. Yeah. And <laughs> but, but when you do that, is that all in one class period? Where because you said you you collect them and then you discuss them. So it'll be like homework. It'll be you know. So they have their normal homework. If you have a discuss, so I will teach discussion sections or I sometimes teach language classes, and it's something you can add on that's a little more fun actually. So if you send out like a blog post and say, hey, all you have to do is write two sentences. So even the students who just read the first paragraph have to write like two sentences about it, mm -hmm. and it actually gets you, so that's their homework, and then they'll send it to me, and then I put it together, so then like the next time we meet, I can hand back to them, hey, this is what you all said, it's anonymized, it's just, a, you know, I'll select at least one thing from everyone, and, um, then we can discuss it. And so in that, in that case, the, the community is the community of students sharing their own experiences. And we had a discussion a little bit about this yesterday um, with Top Hat. Duncan Carl Smith talked about how he uses Top Hat to um, have the students answer a question. And then all of those questions, yeah. get, so they scroll by on screen. And the students are able to see not just their own thoughts and what the instructor says, but they're able to see what all the people sitting next to them, anonymized, you know, are thinking about that, and so they can kind of see, well, where am I in this list? You know, is my understanding aligning with them? Is it different from them? Is everyone else wrong? Should I say something about that? And that's and a. I guess one of the other things that starts happening is then students start sending me like, oh, I encountered this cool, like I was watching TV and this came up. And so then I can share it with the rest of the class and be like one of your classmates. So then they start noticing, because I'm already attuned to every classical reference I ever like, <laughs> I hear every single day, but they start becoming more attuned to how their coursework might relate to so if they start things to see they it, see in real life, yeah. Right, so they start seeing, they start revisiting course content every day in their life, which is you know, yeah. that's what we want for all of our classes is, no, students, pay attention to this. It's important, or at least it's important enough for us because we're teaching it, so we want it to be important to you, too. You know, one, one factor I'd like to add in is kind of like, you know, sometimes I have the feeling that um, things like this kind of like take up time for that used to be taken up by something else and you kind of feel guilty about it. But I, it's a matter of priorities in a way, you know, as to, you know, whether you want something that's, I mean, I know the minimalist principle and stuff, I, can, I relate to that, but on the other hand, what's more important for them and how do I bring in the experts into uh, the, the conversation, you know, that um, relates the content matter to community and to, you know, the, I mean, those soft skills that we talked about, you know, it, it's, it, you know, it could be a major thing. I mean, I, it may be even more important than the content that you try to Oh, I, I, is I don't, that I would say that it's not maybe more important <laughs> than the content because your first point when you introduced yourself was right on. Motivation, intrinsic motivation is key. If the students find a connection, you don't have to supply the content. They'll go dig out on it themselves. Yeah, but okay, that, I, I agree with that 100%. It, it's just that, you know, I get the feeling in a lot of these things that have been brought up over the years that, you know, it, what used to be intrinsic or, or implicit is now explicit and somehow, you know, like you get, you create a feeling that it takes away time from something else, you know? and. That, I, I think, is just a matter of priorities. What you think is, you know, how can my courses be most useful to, you know, the, the people enrolling in it? Yeah. Well, that, yeah, and that kind of sets up a you know, comparison to the very, like, traditional old-fashioned, which is just nothing but monologue, just a, the subject matter expert there lecturing and the person who scrambling to get notes. 
yeah, what's the fine balance? You know, okay, fine, I accept that that's not the perfect way to go, but does that mean we completely flip it and now it's all 100%, they're all talking to each other and they're all like, you know, discovering together. It's like, well, they're not discovering what they need to discover. And then I see, you know, somehow I need to pull some of that back and I need to re-own you know, re that mastery position. Yeah, it's like a balance between reflective yeah. and critical. And that's different. You know, like I, yeah, I mean, it's going to be different for I'm sure every course that's being taught, so you got to be really ready to, you know, read the material. Some of it they can do on their own. So let's talk about that balance between sort of the, the guidance versus exploration, right? Because if they just explore with no guidance, yeah. then they can just be going around in the circles or down a garden that? path that leads them to nothing but beautiful flowers, but isn't necessarily a, the real world, right? So... How do we do that? I, I think I, I always struggle with that, how much content you're presenting and you know, and using videos and case examples a lot with my courses just because that I think that works with, with at least my field a lot. But I um, I have really felt like the students need background before we start having them discuss oh, totally. and, uh, information. And so, and I, and it's a balancing act, and they also need time to reflect before they start discussing. And so I used to think of reflections as sort of silly little things we made people do that weren't that meaningful until I started reading student reflections, and I thought, <laughs> wow, <laughs> these are really important. Um, and so I think, I think we can present content and have sort of like you're talking about having them reflect and think about it. <coughs> ahead of time and then when we have the resources when they're um, with I, I do have this for my crime class where we have discussion sections they come in having thought about some of the material um, ahead of time which I really um, appreciate because I think I don't like going to things where I don't have any information and we're just inform all of the uninformed are informing each other of, of, of yeah. things and I don't think students like that um, either, but I, but I also think that sometimes I'll present something and I want to discuss it, and they're all like stunned by you know, especially if it's community based and it's powerful or emotional in some way, and they, they don't have time. So I think reflections can help us have them have some time to process and make that connection before they have to talk. And those examples, in addition to providing the context and the sort of reflection, they can be very sort of personally meaningful because it's a real situation, or they're real people a thousand, two thousand years ago, or they're students last semester who are saying, I started off just like you with these fears and uncertainties and I survived and you can too. Like there's a there's reassurance as well as sort of the what is the context. And that those example stories and cases can help us provide that structure for, or the guidance, right? Because students love examples, and they love models, and they love being able to see themselves in those models, which is that reflective piece. And if they can see, all right, and there's also a little bit of competition there with right, students, right? That's why I think that's part of school in general right now. But, oh, somebody did this, I can do this, and you know, the bar is here, and I don't need to just get to the bar, I need to exceed the bar. And so the next time it's a little bit higher. But those, if we can collect those past experiences from students in authentic voices, I think that goes a long way towards guiding the next group of students in these things. And that can also, I think, provide a lot of that plug and play. Um, if we get examples from other instructors about, oh, I tried this. Oh, let me try this. Tell me more about it. I would also assume then that part of this purposeful action then is just constant review. I mean, if not at least every semester, maybe even every week, just kind of constantly reevaluating what happened. Was that too much? Was it not enough? Should I do a little bit of this? What worked well with it? And whether, I don't know how you get that feedback, if it's going to be an overt effort through some kind of a survey or a end of year, you know, okay, we're at the week four point, if I give me your thoughts about this, are we doing you know, too much, too little, what do you think? Whatever, just the part of the purposeful action is saying there is no perfect answer for any one class. Just keep revisiting it and, and well, just let that now be part of the new normal is that you're just constantly reinventing, constantly. And we have to do that. Yeah. This is, I think, a, a change in education over the last even decade. Bef yeah. A decade ago, there was a lot of this is the way the class has always been taught. 
this is the body of information that we draw from. In the classics, it's, you know, that body of information, the canon has been there forever, right? All it feels like. And in something like urban planning, it changes more often, but there's still sort of some basics. And I feel like now, with Gmail having like seven changes every week to it, or Google, you know, things change so quickly. <coughs> if our courses don't reflect that, they're kind of an anomaly <coughs> in the world. So that idea of constant reflection, constant iteration and refining yeah. is, is, is part and parcel to a, a course, not just for the instructor, but for the students as well. Yeah. And I think that if we can give them, as part of the assignment, give me feedback on this assignment, what worked about it, what didn't work about it, give them two points for answering those two <coughs> questions, and that way you as an instructor learn about it, they do this reflective post debrief on what worked for them and what didn't work for them. Anytime that we have students reflect on their learning, that's a plus for the learning. So it's really, how can we build it in? I'm really struck by when you're talking about that, what, how that's role modeling purposeful action when you do that as an instructor, right? That you care about the community and the classroom. I hadn't really thought about it that way until I heard you talk about it. I thought that's a nice role model well, I, in terms of that. You know? I didn't catch it when I was talking about it, but now that you say it, it's like, yeah, because in a, a classroom, a classroom is a community. Right. And as an instructor, if I can be humble enough to recognize that I make mistakes and that my assignment isn't perfect and that maybe it can be revised and refined according to the needs of the room, that, that is role modeling. <laughs> role model. I want to check in on the online participants. Are there any questions that Haley or Lauren have about anything? How are we? Are they still there? Did they all leave? They're still there. Lauren still doesn't have audio. Oh, I'm sorry, Lauren. And I messed up our screen sharing settings, but they can see the room, just not. You don't have anything on the screen right now, anyway. No, I don't think so. It's just the. Haley was waving to me. Oh. <laughs> hey. Oh, I see it. Is that a thumbs up? No. She's talking, but we can't hear her. Because you have your audio, your speaker turned off. That's why we can't hear. Yeah. This is this is hard to figure out. Yeah. Echo, I'll turn back down. She says she's in private. Oh, excellent! Thank you. The distinction between active learning and purposeful action. Easy for me, active uh, in my opinion. <coughs> um, active learning is simply engaging in content in an active way. And I use um, Mickey Cheese 2009 definition or elements of active, constructive, and interactive. Active learning is just something as simple as taking notes. I'm having physical movement while I'm learning. Constructive learning is I'm going to make something based on my understanding of this. In many ways, this purposeful action is at that level. I'm going to create something, and it's not necessarily tied with the community yet, but I'm creating something that maybe can affect the community. Maybe I'm inventing a water system that'll bring something. It's not directly interacting with humans, but it's doing something constructive, constructing something. And then the top level is interactive, which is not just me interacting with something, but interacting <coughs> with someone else to come up with a group understanding. What we're doing right here is interactive learning. It is the, the highest level of, of active learning because I don't know the answers to what is purposeful action. But I'm getting input from all of us as we're trying to figure out this out. And so we're constructing something together and understandings. Lauren. And I would say that 
constructive is purposeful. Otherwise, why would you bother constructing? <coughs> so as long as it goes beyond just um, a construction of exactly what the content knowledge was that you took in, but it actually had a purpose for constructing it, you started leading your way towards, and then the action part would come when it impacts other people. Right, and being impacted by other people. Right. So that my own learning is not just me figuring stuff out, but it's because Justine gave me some insight and that has changed and helped me understand it better. That's where that interactive element comes in. And what you constructed led somebody else to look at that and continue their construction on their own of their own knowledge. Does that help, <laughs> Haley? <laughs> um, Let's talk about individual versus group because this gets into the logistics of it and back to one of the things that Cliff had talked about was um, we don't just want a whole bunch of people running around doing this, we want to sort of guide this. Groups can help sort of corral or herd the, <coughs> the cats in one direction um, because they have to figure out how to work together as, as a group so they will and that's part of the soft skills. They'll, have, they'll do some. That, that gets it to this interactive level. That gets it to the interactive level. It even, seems even have, it, seems, it seems to have an odd interaction with choice, right? So, so yes and no. Um, in some ways, all of our choices are mediated, right? We, we're not free actors in the world. We have to eat and <laughs> do all of these things. We're in a deep philosophical discussion today. So everything that we do has some level of constraint, but even within those constraints, we find ways to, you know, the painter paints with the palette that he or she has, um, they can't choose a color that doesn't exist or that they don't own. So can I make choices within the constraints that I'm given? Absolutely. And in some ways, a group is a great way to do this because I have to do that by, by having to do that, I have to dig a little bit deeper. Um, I was a writing major in my undergrad, and free form poetry is the easiest, but it's also kind of can be the suckiest, because I can do anything. <laughs> but the really, really hard things are the sestinas, where I've got to match and rhyme and do iambic pentameter and all of these things, and it gets really, really complex. But it makes me work so much harder to be able to write the thing that I need to do because I've got to make, you know, it's got to fit this thing and it's got to fit that thing. I've got to fit all these pieces together and be creative. So it's harder, but it's also, there's like more value because I've been pressed a little bit farther outside of my comfort zone. I guess, I guess what I'm getting at is if there are, and there are potentially multiple projects that, that can be used, at least in the course that I'm envisioning, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and teams do seem like logistically sort of the superior approach, you know, do, do you sort of let them self-select into, you know, these people want to work on this one, and, you know, it's that kind of thing. If mm -hmm. it was on an individual level, that seems really easy. Who wants to, to work on what? Or maybe it's just, you know, polling at the beginning. Well, and think about not just the topic, but yeah. what are the roles within the topic? Right, right. So in a team on a project, what might be three roles that they would have? There might be a, I don't know, project manager, you might have an urban planning, I'm, I'm out of my league here, but I'm gonna guess. Um, somebody looking at the environmental considerations, somebody looking at the social considerations, somebody looking at administrative policy considerations. Um, so, That's a good point. you could be like, all right, if you want to be a policy person, here are your options. If you want to be a, in, if your love for this project is better, and you are like, all right, I've already had some experience in policy, I want to look at the environmental elements, maybe I'll choose a topic over the role, but maybe I'll choose the role over the topic, or maybe there's another role that I don't hit, or th that I can bring into this, and, and I can be like, I want to take this approach. Yeah, the, the guest speaker in January, or one of them, was, was sort of getting, talking about, there was the, the whole discussion about whether you assign people or let them sort of sell <coughs> Other thoughts on groups versus individuals? 
things people have tried that have worked besides roles and topics? You know, I, I think, um, you know, the team-based approach has a lot of th things going for it because it forces people to interact with one another and to make it work and to reach consensus about the stuff and to say, oh, I didn't understand this. Did you understand that? It's kind of like a little neighborhood in a, in a bigger picture, in a way. And, you know, sometimes from the very introduction, you know, like, I mean, when you, when you ask people to introduce themselves, it kind of is obvious the purposeful action, you know, in terms of, I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. There was uh, one woman in my class said, well, you know, the, the, the reason why I really, why I want to take your class, you know, neural control of movement is that my dad had an accident and he is a quadriplegic now, and I want to understand more about, you know, how movement is organized to be better understand to how to help him and how, you know, so that kind of like puts a purposeful action right in the introduction, right at the, you know, the intrinsic motivation part of the whole thing that drives the, the entire process afterwards. And so, you know, in a team, for example, you know, like people negotiate and say, well, it doesn't become just quadrilateral <coughs> that we're interested in, but it's connected to, well, you know, Jane's dad. You know, and so it, it has this personal, personal um, meaningfulness to it that um, goes way beyond the, the content of you know paralysis and this and that. You know, it's personal, I, it, and, it, and, it, and it makes it personal. And this is one of the biggest things. Going again back to that intrinsic motivation, if the students can connect, especially if they can do it on their own. What is the utility value is what they, they, they call it, the, the phrase utility value, um, of this course? Why should I be interested in this course? Because it's required for the major, not useful at all, because I need three more credits, not useful, because whatever. Because it has a real effect on a real person, that gets somewhere. What is the real effect that it has on my life? Do I know anyone? What are the connections that I can make? And if I can generate those, and it may be our job as instructors to force them to think about, to reflect on what is the context, what, how does it connect with your life? If we can get them going down that path, then they'll <coughs> start to see more and more examples of, oh, I can apply it here as well. And that's great. Um, Justine, you were talking about all of the other classes that they have. How do we make active learning part of not just the one course, but holistic? Utility value and the idea of purposeful action could be as simple as, you know what I do in this class? I can connect it to this other class that I'm having. And now all of a sudden, I don't have to do all the work for this class and all the work for this class separate. I can do all the work for this class and 10% of it applies to this. That's that's some utility value right there. I'm saving 10% of my efforts by reapplying it. And that's different from what, at least it was like when I was growing up in undergrad. If we had a paper in one area, we could not use that for, I mean, you can't turn in the same paper, obviously. But even the same topic, if I'm doing research on the topic and I look at this aspect of it for this course and this other aspect of it for that course, I'm reading about the topic, I'm getting a better understanding of it from two different perspectives for two different purposes. That's super useful way for me to save time and I'll learn more about it. It's not siloing the courses, it's pulling them together. And the third easy step is then, now how do I make it useful for the community? All right, I feel like we need to do more minimal interventions before we leave, otherwise, what are some quick things we can do? So modeling we talked about. We talked about making the connections via case studies and discussions. We talked about reflections. <coughs> I wonder about, I mean, this wouldn't be like minimal work for the instructor, but as far as for the course having like we often talk about the university going into the community, but having some way 
of the community to come into the university. So even having a lecture, a guest lecture by someone who's not the faculty member and who's not a university member. That's going to be half my class. Yeah. <laughs> Just people coming in. And, and so that, I mean, that at least for the students, that's no extra work for the students. And you can convey a lot of the content. So it, it, it would take, I mean, you have to make good choices and it's more work than structure. Wow. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. we can use tools like Blackboard Collaborate, so they don't actually have to come in. You don't have to find them a parking spot on campus and you know, buy them coffee and donuts and whatever. You can just plug them in here and buy them coffee and a, you know, a beer later on. You know, <laughs> not related to class. But there's a way to, and that way you, you, they don't have to be in Madison. You can start saying, I want somebody you know, who's an expert on this in France who can come over virtually and talk about what is it like over there? What are the urban design challenges of different areas throughout the US or, or so I've just been told by people in IES, it's, it's actually not a planning class, it's, it's environmental studies, but and, um, they're like, well, the kids love that. And I, I, I don't know. I, sometimes I've been that person, but do you, do you guys have experience with that? They love it, yeah. They love it. <laughs> I think so. I, I mean, as long as it's meaningful, they get to see sort of people in different roles coming in and they have a sense that they're trying to envision themselves out of school and if, especially if they're not going to be, you know, wanting to go into academia, they're trying to see what other, who could they be, and what would that look like? And, and I think I think students really eat that up. So that's my experience. And them. alumni, especially, like if you can find people who can say, "Oh yeah, I was in that class as well," and now I'm over here, people are going to be like, "Wait, what does your path look like?" Because they're trying to figure out their pathways mm -hmm. and options. Well, right. So this made me come up with an idea, which I have absolutely no idea how to make it happen, um, because I'm not in marketing. But these experts that you're essentially bringing into your class, if there were a way to let the broader community know that this was happening and allow multiple ways for people even outside your class on those particular days to participate, that would be another way of bringing in the community and connecting your students to the community, kind of how John has done with this, um, and that might make some more connections for your students. Instead of a virtual guest speaker, you could have a virtual panel. Yeah. You know, here's role A in France, and here's a person in role B in Boston, and here's a person in role C in Utah, and that might be an interesting, it'd be interesting for the three of them as well, or whoever's on the panel, to be able to discuss that as well. And the students even seeing their interactions would be really sort of interesting. I'm really struck by what you said, but because I oftentimes will find later about some presenter I would have loved to go right. to, or have right. my students go to, or I will go and I'm like, why are there 12 people here seeing this you know, world-renowned person with this great talk? And it's almost on a university-wide level. People are yeah. coming. The know? technology and is there, too, to be able to facilitate this happening. But they're even in person. Right. And you know, if people don't hear about it, it's like the law school has it, but the psych department doesn't hear about it. it. Or the, you know. Right. And so, and I don't know, I mean, it's always really, I'm thinking, well, how would have invited my students, or maybe we could have had a bigger right. theme. I mean, it would be one way to get students' community mm -hmm. connected, even realizing, yeah, you can go to a talk at the law school. Mm -hmm. And actually, then you can write a reflection, I'll give you extra credit for it. Right. Something kind of like that. Right. So, extra credit, yeah, we've. We've started giving extra credit, and it's so minimal. It makes no difference it's to right. anyone's but grade. But it sounds like But the lectures it. are so much more full. Mm -hmm. And then you can ask a student in class, hey, a few of you went to the lecture this week. What would you think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and or require a response, a short response, in order to actually get the credit. And they come up with, I mean, the students have really interesting reflections. And it but then you can, to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The extra credit has, in my department, worked mm -hmm. very Sometimes well. Sometimes it's <laughs> just a little bit of, a, you know, a few yeah. points will get us out of our comfort zone. Yeah. And getting back to the intrinsic motivation piece of it, um, these are the things that the students remember the most. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, this sounds really silly, but I was living in Spain and I have a friend who was a Spanish teacher and I'm working and I suddenly get a Skype call from her and I answer and she was Skyping in from her classroom. And they were studying stuff. 
and she said, hey, do you have some time? I'm like, sure. She said, could you show us what's in your refrigerator? So I literally like took my, my computer and I opened up my refrigerator and I started talking in Spanish about what was in my refrigerator. Well, years later, I run into some of the students that were in her classroom that said, hey, you're the refrigerator lady. I mean, that's, that's the stuff that they remember. It sounds totally stupid, but that's, you know, when you bring stuff in from the outside like that, that's every other day is just another day I'm going to class. Jennifer. Another kind of flip side benefit to this. Um, I think there's also a lot of students on this campus, and I was one in undergrad who aren't really imagining themselves after school. Like, school is this life that you're in, and like beyond that, who knows what's going to happen. And so, if you can see people like functioning in the real world and start to imagine yourself there, then you at least start to think about what might happen. After. Yeah, <laughs> and that's still is that so? That's still the case because I was thinking of myself as an undergraduate, you know, 25 whatever years ago, and just thinking that, that beyond college was totally opaque. Right. And, and we never had anyone come in, so I sort of left school like, well, what do I do now? So that's kind of what I was thinking of, like, make the class that I wish I had had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these connections then provide purpose not just for the students in finding their pathways seeing examples of what life might be like if I start getting organized and do you know well in school. But it can also build connections, empathy and humility, relentless curiosity, it feeds that fuel, the confidence to keep on doing these things. Um, so I think I think it's a win win for the Wisconsin idea, Wisconsin experience. Hey we are out of time. Thank you guys for a, a wonderful conversation. Um, I thought it was really nice anyway. And on your way out, if you could just drop these forms off in that box over here, I would show you. Get a few check marks. If you have any ideas, that's great. Come right here, just come to the eval spot.